Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today. This is pretty important from my Ancient America series. Now in the late 1800s, an important discovery was made when a tree was taken out of the ground and wrapped in the roots. There was a stone found just north of Kensington, Minnesota here. Now this is a very important video for my Ancient America series, so I thought we should talk to the guy who knows the most about this. So let's just go to an interview. All right, and I'm joined now by uh, Scott Walter. Scott, I really appreciate you joining me today. Hey, no problem. Happy to do it. And uh, I apologize for any background noise. I'm driving uh, through Arkansas right now on my way to a conference, but uh, let's do it. All right. Now, you first were told of the Kensington Runestone, I believe, almost 20 years ago. Is that correct? Yeah, it'll be 20 years ago uh, in about six months. But, um, yeah, I was contacted by a representative of the Runestone Museum who asked me if I would perform a forensic uh, analysis uh, on the Kensington Runestone. And the first thing I said to that person is, what's that? <laughs> they said it to me like I, I, I already knew what it was, but I had never heard of the Runestone at that point. I didn't know what it was. And um, it really wouldn't have made any difference because I, you know, I'm an independent investigator. But the truth is, I never, I didn't know anything about it, so I went into it with, with no preconceived anything. And I think that's very important as far as doing any kind of research, not to have any preconceived ideas. Well, absolutely. and especially as a ge geologist, because your work, you have to kind of make that stand up, and even in a court of law, sometime. And it's, oh, yeah. It, yeah, absolutely. I'm often called to testify as an expert witness in cases that involve the work that we've done on a project. Usually it's associated with the, uh, uh, the construction industry, but in this case it was a little, little different. But the process of investigation is the same. You, you start with a blank slate, you compile as many facts as possible, um, then you make interpretations if that's appropriate, and uh, you know at some point, uh, if you're able to draw a conclusion. Now I'm presuming this, but the Kensington Rune Stone is the thing that got you into ancient mysteries. Is that a safe oh, assumption? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. It's what started the whole ball rolling, and um, you know now that I look back on it with 20 years of hindsight. Uh, I'm really glad that this happened because it opened up a whole new world to me that I didn't even know existed and um, a whole new world of opportunities that I've tried to take advantage of and it's led to a bunch of really cool things, most notably doing television and uh, bringing a lot of this work that we've been able to do to, to the world. And I think it's very important because the story that we are told is so inadequate and incomplete. I just think all these new findings these days are so important to get out there and really tell people and really argue your case that this is super important. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we live in a world of, you know, fake this, fake news, fake that. And, uh, uh, it's hard to know what, what truth is anymore and it's really disappointing um, for me to sort of see where um, we as, as a society are right now and I just think that it's so important to have the, the story straight and at the end of the day the truth always does you know bubble to the surface the most important historical artifacts certainly in this country um, and arguably um, a big part of the world when you really understand the history of, of who carved it where they came from and why you know I mean those are the questions that I looked at after we came to the final conclusion that it was an authentic medieval artifact well I mean at that point if it's authentic then these things are absolutely true somebody carved it they came from some place for some reason and that's what we've been working on for the last, you know, 20 years. And I, I, I think I can say with confidence, I think we have it all figured out. I think that's uh, very important. It's a, it, somebody did this and it's so obvious and 
as a researcher, I did not have to make any jumps, any leaps to get to the truth of this. Now, let me ask you one other question. Uh, you went to college at the University of Minnesota Duluth, like I did. Are, were you kind of surprised that you had never heard about the Kensington Runestone? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, I think, you know, at the time I became involved, the, the narrative was this was a hoax. So I don't think anybody uh, was taking it that seriously. And so why would you, why would anybody in a serious environment like, you know, a college environment take something like this seriously, even if it was something that was, you know, uh, a Minnesota thing. But, um, I, and that's really the only reason I can think of why it wasn't taken seriously. It's because it wasn't a serious thing. It just, it wasn't. So it never really crossed my radar. And if it did, I wasn't paying attention. I was probably thinking about girls or football. <laughs> right. All right. Now let's talk about Olaf Ullman. And uh, right. now people said that he, I mean, he was accused of uh, perpetrating the hoax. What can you, right. do, do you think Olaf Ullman was the joking type, the guy who, you know, <laughs> might have done this in the late 1800s? Does that well, make answer, any sense to you? The answer to that question, again, now that I know what I know, uh, is absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's laughable to accuse Olaf Ullman. And, and the truth is, there was nobody walking on the planet in 1898 that would have been capable of carving an inscription of this complexity and length with all of the allegorical information that's embedded within it, the symbolism, the code. Um, it, it's such a complex document. And, you know, I also have gotten to know over the years uh, the grandson and, and the descendants of Olaf Ullman. And while they are not the, uh, you know, the, the, the individual, they're not Olaf Ullman, um, I, I can tell you based on my interactions with that family and, and what I know about Olaf Ullman, including reading his own writings, is that he was a very serious man. He was very intelligent, um, but he wasn't formally educated. That doesn't mean that he was stupid. He was far from it. Um, and a lot of the things that happened after the rune stone was discovered were misinterpreted by investigators uh, who were looking for what they wanted to find. I'll give you an example. There were two books that Olaf Ullman had in his home that investigators many years after the discovery found. Uh, one of them was a book that had an old Viking era uh, runic alphabet in it, which you couldn't even get close to carving the Kensington rune stones. Um, with, you know, using that book. But the fact is that book came into his home after he found the rune stones. Um, one of his neighbors gave it to him um, so he could try to figure out what was in the inscription because he was curious, right? Well, if he had carved the inscription, why, why would he be curious? I mean, right. he knew what it said if he carved it, right? But the truth is he couldn't make heads or tails of it. But the fact is, is he didn't have the book in the first place when he found the stone. But th th that is something that we brought out. That was a, a myth that has been floating around for, for a century. And, and there was another book that had some information, and it too came into his possession after he found the rune stone. So that's just, that's just a non-starter from the get-go. Now, the people who try to talk against the Kensington rune stone they come up with a lot of different stories or reasons, but it seems the main one is simply it doesn't fit in with the history that supposedly happened and the history we are taught. And, well, and you know, Chuck, I, I think that's that's part of it, but really, when it comes to the Kensington Runestone, you know, the scholars and the so-called experts that dismissed it, um, really it boiled down to two things. One is they used improper scientific method, okay? And and the truth is these people are not scientists. I mean, they, they talk big, even to this day. Uh, well, we use, you know, scientific investigation method, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you did, then why didn't you? And, and basically it boils down to this. 
For 120 years, scholars have been trying to tell the Kensington Room Saw what it's supposed to be, instead of letting the artifact tell them what it is. And, and it's really that simple. It's, it's really a problem of method. And, you know, and, and I'll tell you what the method was. Well, this inscription has runes in it, therefore it is a rune stone. Being a rune stone, it must have this, 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 and this. No, no, <laughs> no, that is not how you do things. Um, and that, that's, that's the first thing. And then, of course, what happened is it didn't fit, you know, the paradigm that they had already established. So then they dismiss it. But the other part of the problem is, is that they were not honest, okay? The truth is they had no clue what it was. It didn't fit what they thought it should be, and instead of admitting that they didn't know, okay, which is okay, it's okay to say, I don't know, but instead of doing that, they just made it go away because they didn't want to run the risk of looking stupid. Now, a, a true scientist doesn't have to worry about that because all you have to say is, is we don't have enough evidence, and it's still an open question. That's okay. And I'm not afraid to do that. I've done that many times. And I just said, look, I can't draw an opinion because I don't have enough evidence to support any opinion at this point. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. Now, when you did the comparative weathering study, and, right. and this was really important to me because I wanted to know, I want to know how old the stone was. Because if it was modern, then what was on it was really inconsequential. Right. And d you actually found out that a uh, University of Minnesota geologist a long time ago, maybe a century ago, ended up doing yes. the, the same study that you did, and he found it to be an old artifact. And then this he found it to be authentic, correct? And then this yeah, kind of got whitewashed. Well, yes, and, and I'm glad you brought up Newton Winchell. Uh, Newton Winchell was the first state geologist of Minnesota. Um, a man that had a brilliant career and basically was pulled out of retirement by the museum committee of the Minnesota Historical Society to do a forensic investigation. Now, I want to put this in context because this is really important. I mean, I knew who Newton Winchell was um, when I was in college. He is a giant in the field of geology. So I certainly knew who he was and I knew his reputation as being um, flawless, right? But at the time I did my work, my initial work on the Kensington Runestone, I had no idea that Newt Winchell had worked on the Runestone. I knew nothing about that. And it wasn't until after I had drawn my conclusion that it was authentic based on a relative age weathering study using tombstones as my control samples that I found out that Winchell had already done some work. And I got to tell you, I, I was nervous. I went, oh, crap. <laughs> yep. What, hap what happens if he reached a different conclusion, right? I'm done. Is the, uh, and, is the geology building, is that what I remember at the University yeah, of Minnesota the, named at after him? the University him? of Minnesota okay. is called Winchell Hall. Okay. So we're talking about a giant in, in the field of geology. That's why I was concerned initially. But, you know, I just said, well, hey, I just... It is what it is. Let's go check it out. So I went to the Historical Society, and I I went into the files, and I looked at Newton Winchell's work, um, and I read his report, and I'll never forget when um, I found his concluding letter. And basically what he said was this. The said stone is not a modern forgery and must be accepted as a genuine record of exploration in Minnesota at the date stated in the inscription. That's exactly what he wrote, and I'll, I've memorized it. I'll never forget it. And as soon as I read that, I just sat back in my chair, and I wiped my brow, and I went, whew. Verified, <laughs> and then I thought of, yeah. You know, I was like, oh, well, he came to the same conclusion. But then I thought about it, and I went, wait a minute. I had no reason to be nervous, because all I did was independently replicate what he already did. And you know what? That's the way it works in science, and uh, it worked here too. Um, you know, even though I was able to replicate 
his work. Um, we did have, you know, modern equipment. We were able to take a little bit farther than he did, but um, I think that really underscores, you know, his correct opinion. You know, he didn't have the fancy equipment that, that we have now. But what I really want people to make sure they understand and remember, um, there's a lot of people that want to give me credit for solving the Kensington Runestone, and that's just not true. The guy that solved the Kensington Runestone was Newt Winchell. I just came along 90 years later, and, you know, he his... He died shortly after, within about five years after he wrote that that final conclusion. And people really couldn't attack his character. They couldn't attack the work. So they just marginalized him by, by, by not mentioning it, right? Right. And uh, it just was sort of pushed into the shadows. And that was wrong. And I want to make sure that people don't forget who he was and the great work that he did. And he's the guy that deserves credit for solving the runestone, not me or anybody else. Well said. Now, it seems like one of the things people attack about the runestone is they say very simply that these are freshly carved. <laughs> well, that's wrong. <laughs> and Olaf Ullman actually scratched out and cleaned out the, the runes and with a nail or something and he put fresh scratch marks in and that was just the easy way for people try to to try to debunk it right well i i mean let's give the, the the people that saw that a little bit of credit because i have to admit when i first saw the runestone i saw those scratches as, as well and my first impression was it didn't look old um and you know i later i later found out that after the initial studies were done by the runologist in 1899 the stone was sent back to olaf Ullman. um well actually before they even did their studies it was it was displayed in the jewelry store in the fall uh up till about this time of year and then it was um uh, given back to Olaf Ullman who took it out to the farm and it still had mud in the grooves and that's why he scratched it out because he wanted to see what was there now you know it, 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 some people have claimed that he um, scratched out the rune or he uh, you know carved the rune stone and then put it in the ground for a number of years to create this aged look well if that was the case why would he scratch out the very evidence he tried to create I mean that goes against that argument but the truth is he didn't realize what he was doing and so he put those scratches in because he was curious like I said he was an intelligent guy and he wanted to figure out what he found and those so, scratches and those scratches were kind of white in color and that was the first yeah, thing they, you noticed yeah I mean it, it, if you take a, a nail or a knife and you, you you scratch a rock, it'll leave a white mark, right? And this is exactly what happened. But when I got the stone under the microscope, I could see that the bottom of the grooves were fresh because the weathering had been scratched off. But the walls of the grooves were weathered. And then as I looked at it, I went, ah, okay. And then later I found out that he had scratched it out because he said he did. And, and it all made sense to me. And, and it, everything has to fit, right? When you're doing a forensic investigation, um, you know, why was the bottom fresh looking and the walls were weathered? Well, we got the answer when we got his testimony that he said he scratched it out. So everything fit and explained um, the, quote, fresh look that really many people later on looked at and they thought, well, this looks fresh to me. Now we understand why, but in fact, it had nothing to do with the true age of the inscription. All right. Now, the Ullman family and people who investigated the Kensington Runestone, this kind of upset me when I read about this. The Ullman family was actually kind of attacked by people in the community. Yeah, by some people in the community. Some yeah. people, yeah. And then people who later did studies on the Kensington Runestone in the scholarly field, did some of their uh, careers kind of suffer from that, or did they have serious pushback? I'm trying to remember what I heard in some of your lectures. Well, the um, yeah, the family certainly received criticism, and Olaf Ullman, uh, you know, for perpetrating what some thought was a hoax. A hoax. A lot of people 
that felt negatively about it. Um, in fact, there was one guy, the deathbed confession, John Gran and Walter Gran, his son, made a, so, a, a so-called deathbed confession. But when you read the transcript of this so-called confession, there really is no confession because um, uh, Russ Fridley, who was the former director of the Minnesota Historical Society and actually a really good friend of mine and um, the grandson of Olaf Omen, Darwin Omen. In fact, for years, the three of us would meet and talk about various aspects of the runestone. And, and I will tell you, um, to Russ's credit, he came around. And shortly before he died, he said to uh, to Darwin and I that Olaf didn't do it. Now, I don't know if he was 100% convinced that the runestone was authentic, but he was 100% convinced that Olaf Omen didn't do it. And I have to give Russ a lot of credit because, you know, most people are so firmly entrenched in their beliefs. Um, you know, you can, you can show them a white piece of paper and they'll say, no, that's black. <laughs> and, you know, Russ listened, he considered the evidence, and he changed his mind. And, and that's really important uh, because he was the guy who was thought of as, you know, the biggest denier of the runestone, and he came around. So he really deserves a lot of credit. And uh, I wish more people had the integrity that, that Russ did to be able to objectively look at new evidence that he had never heard and, uh, and and change their opinion. But he was the guy who interviewed Walter Graham in 1970. And again, Walter Graham said, my dad said that me and Olaf did it. And, you know, I said, I remember we talked about this with Russ and I said, Russ, you know, did you press him on that point? He said, yes, I did. And in the transcript, um, he says, well, did you talk to your father? And Walter Grant said, yes. And then, well, what did he say? And then what his father said, he said, go ask Olaf Ullman. He didn't give many details about how they did it, who planned it, who carved it, any of the stuff you would think that somebody giving a true confession would say. And then when, and so Walter went to Olaf Ullman. And what did Olaf Ullman say when, when he said, when he asked him, you know, did you and my father do it? And he said, that's a bunch of humbug. Mm -hmm. And said, so, so there's, there's no confession. But the other thing that's really important is why would a guy like that say that? Why would John Graham say that? Well, it turns out John Graham was a very prominent person in the uh, area of Kensington at the time. He owned three different properties, and but he was ideologically different than Olaf Ullman. Okay. Um, and I think it was driven by jealousy, because here was a guy who was one of the most prominent people in the community, but yet the, the person that everybody talked about was this poor farmer, Olaf Ullman, who found this runestone. And in fact, when you go back and you look at the 1912 flat map of uh, Doug, uh, 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 Douglas County, John Grand gets two lines. And this was sort of where you would get attention in the community, right? This is right. The, sort of the official statement of who you were. And when you read about Olaf Ullman, there's 12 lines, and they talk about the runestone. And so here was a guy that, in John Grand's opinion, was a person who was beneath him, but yet he got more attention and so, therefore, uh, I believe that's what drove him to make up this story. I mean, that's speculation, of course. We're never going to know the truth. But there was one other interesting story that I'd love to tell you about John Grant and Olaf Ullman. And it was told to me by somebody who was 99 years old and knew both of these people when they were a young person, both John Grant and Olaf Ullman as adults. I talked to him myself. And the story he told me was one day John Grant was coming home from church and Olaf Ullman was fixing a fence that his cattle had knocked down and they were in his farmer's field. And uh, John Grant said something to the effect, you know, Ullman, the Lord isn't going to look too kindly. You're working on a Sunday. And Olaf Ullman shot back to him and said, well, 
he said, my neighbor isn't going to look too kindly on my cattle knocking down his crops, so why don't you shove off and mind your own business? <laughs> and you can, you can take that for what it's worth. That sounds like a legit story to me, and, and I think puts context on this whole deathbed confession nonsense. All right, let's talk about one other aspect that I wanted to bring up. Some people say the Vikings were in Minnesota in 1362. And that well, is, that's, that's wrong. That, that's just that's just historically completely wrong. And, you know, I have to say, uh, being a geologist, and, and I'm, I, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't call myself necessarily a historian, although on some of the programs I've been on, they have called me a historian. Um, but I can tell you this, I, 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 you know, 1362 is three centuries after 1066, when that was the latest that uh, you could really talk about Vikings. Um, Christianity had gone through Europe and there were no longer any more Vikings. So to call the Kensington Runestone or to associate it with Vikings is just historically incorrect. And, uh, you know, that's a myth that, again, has hung around for a long time that is just so wrong and inaccurate. It's laughable, but, you know, old, old ideas die hard, I guess. Now, 1362 and the inscription on it, you think it is maybe carved by people associated with the Cistercians? And exactly who are the Cistercians? Well, the Cistercians were the white monks who were part of uh, the most successful uh, monastic order in history. But yet nobody ever talks about them. Very few people know who they are. And they were the ones that were led by, in the early years, a guy by the name of St. Bernard de Clairvaux, who joined the Cistercian Abbey, or the Cistercian Order, in 1113 with 30 family members, including two uncles who were part of the Knights Templar Order, who fought the First Crusade and captured the Holy Land. And so this was actually a coup d'etat the greatest coup d'etat in history that people don't realize. But Bernard de Clairvaux joined the order at Citeaux, France, when there was one abbey, one Cistercian abbey in the world. And he founded the, the, the first daughter abbey, the second abbey, at, at Clairvaux in France. But by the time he died in 1153, there were over 300 Cistercian abbeys all across Europe, uh, into the Holy Land, and, and into Scandinavia. Um, so this guy was um, just an amazing person. And in 1128, he wrote the charter, the official charter for the Knights Templar Order that was based on the Cistercian Charter, and, uh, and that's when the order became official. Now, there's really only one group that could possibly have carved the runestone in 1362, and they had the means, the money, the motivation, and it's the Knights Templar. Nobody else could have done it, and, uh, you know, I've made many arguments as to why this is true, and uh, I've added a few more recently in my latest book, Cryptic Code of uh, the Templars in America, and really, um, if you think about it, 1362 is, you know, just a few decades after the put down of the Knights Templar Order in 1307, and they had every reason to found a new sanctuary, right. a, new, a new home, what they call a free Templar state in North America. And the true ideology of the Templars was absolutely compatible with Native Americans. And that's why they were so successful on this continent. They didn't fight their way to Kensington. They traveled with the indigenous people, who they shared a common ideology of, of, of monotheistic dualism, venerating the feminine aspects of the Godhead, which they kept secret when they were over in Europe. Now, one thing that I have noticed during, during my Ancient America series, now the big question to me was, who was in the Americas before Columbus? And now, after I've done about 150 Ancient America videos, the question I have is who was not in the Americas? <laughs> is, is that yeah. something that you have kind of come to understand and uh, just go on about talking about the Templars? Sure, sure. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I think um, I think uh, there's ample evidence to show that there were many different cultures that came here over a period of thousands of years, and um, there's no way somebody can say that they didn't. They because they simply don't know. And the more more evidence that comes forward, the more we realize how complicated. And, uh, and rich the history is of this North American continent. But, but really, the last group of pre-Columbian uh, people to come here were the Knights Templar. No question about it. Uh, the indigenous people know all about them. Uh, they shared rituals with them, and uh, there's really a, a, a rich history there. But at the end of the day, you know, the Templars absolutely had every reason to come over here. And um, they were the ones that suffered from the uh, uh, the tyranny of the monarchs of Europe, right? The French king and yep. uh, and the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, they those are two of the main tenets that, not coincidentally, we see in our Constitution. And everybody knows that in this, you know, in this country. Um, this is not a monarchy. This is a democracy. And um, we fought a revolution against a monarchy, against <laughs> against the throne in England, right? Yep. Does that sound familiar? And we have freedom of religion in this country. You can believe in any deity that you want. Um, that, again, reflects on the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church that the Templars suffered from. And the truth of the matter is the Templars were here for centuries, even before the Kensington Runestone was carved and buried as a land claim. And then that obligation was passed on from the medieval Templars to the craft, as we call it, or to Freemasonry and to our founding fathers, who were not just all Freemasons, they were also Knights Templar. And they knew about the runestone. They knew about the Newport Tower. They knew all about the Templars that were here. They just didn't say anything about it. But yet, they instituted those principles into our Constitution, which is a Masonic document. And I strongly recommend that people take the time to sit down and read it carefully and think about this in context with things like the Kensington runestone. No. And, and realize that the beginning of this country did not happen in 1776. The official beginning began in 1362 with the Kensington Runestone. And the Freemasons wanted to erect an obelisk in Kensington, Minnesota. I found that very odd. Uh, that's not so odd. That's absolutely consistent with everything that I've been talking about because the obelisk is an iconic symbol of Freemasonry that's found in Freemasonry. Um, and I think we have one in Washington, D.C., right? Yep, yep. Erected in the name of who? The first president and Freemason and Masonic Knights Templar, George Washington. This, folks, hidden in plain sight. It's no longer hidden anymore. Now, the Knights Templar, they wanted, now, what it says on the stone, and I think uh, this has been kind of uh, changed from the original interpretation, but they were on a mission of acquiring land. It says on line, on the first three lines, it says eight Goths, Gothlanders, and 22 Northmen on this acquisition business slash taking up land from Vinland far to the west. I don't know how more clear it could be. It's a, it's a land claim. Could you and talk? The land, claim, could... the land claim practice in the 14th century, I mean, this went on for a long time. I mean, you carve or you, you uh, forge a plaque that says, I claim this name, uh, this land, usually in the name of a monarch or a king. But the Kensington Runestone doesn't say that, does it? No. And, we, and now we know why. <laughs> right. Because the Templars certainly aren't going to uh, make a land claim in the name of a monarch or a king. That's that's who they were fighting against. Right. So that is also consistent with the, 
with the narrative that the, uh, the Templars carved the runestone and founded this nation. And could you talk about the significance of where Kensington is as far as the headwaters of the Mississippi and that That's area? correct. It's right along the north-south continental divide. And in the 14th century, both the French and the Dutch had a land claim practice. And by the way, the French, the um, headquarters for century, the Knights Templar Order, was in Paris, France. But they had a land claim practice where if you could prove you navigated in the headwaters of a river system and placed a land claim stone in the ground and usually a tin plaque and a tree for redundancy, um, you could lay claim to the entire river system and all the land associated with it. And how so and how land, much how much of the United States would that have been? Well, that would have been um, all the land associated with the um, Mississippi Missouri watershed down to the Gulf of Mexico and the Red River Hudson Bay watershed up to the north, which is about half the continent. Significant. But then the runestone says from Vinland far to the west. So theoretically, they made a claim to the entire continent. Sure. And you firmly believe they came through the Great Lakes? Yep, absolutely. La landed where we went to school in Duluth, Minnesota? Uh, that would have been uh, a stopping off point, yep. And, and then, then went by they foot? Walked, they, they walked the rest of the way and canoed. But they were traveling with the natives, right? They were their guides. Okay. And uh, certainly the natives would have understood headwaters, the land of, you know, there's a triple junction up in the Iron Range of Minnesota, and the natives call it the land of three waters, because you can, at that point, you've got three uh, watershed divides that come together, and if you drop, uh, you know, a, a water on that spot, it could either go into the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean following the St. Lawrence River system, um, the Mississippi watershed to the Gulf or the Red River Hudson Bay watershed into uh, Hudson Bay. Okay. And the the stone itself, I believe, is what you call gray whack. Is that correct? Meta, met, meta gray whack, yep. And that came from the Cuyuna Range of Minnesota? You nope, that came, that came from the... Uh, um, the area just south of Duluth near oh, okay. Thompson Dam, okay. the Thompson Formation. I recognized it immediately when I saw it thin section, the two-directional foliation that is diagnostic. It's almost like a DNA fingerprint for that formation. All right. All right. That was one thing I maybe misheard or just my memory is going to my old age. but <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Hey, this, you know, this is pretty heavy geological stuff, so I wouldn't expect you to have that. Uh, necessarily know anything about that. All right. Uh, one last question. We've covered a lot of stuff, Scott. I have tried to learn hieroglyphs in Egypt. There's over a thousand different characters. How hard was it for you to learn the, the ancient runes? Well, I had to work at it, for sure. But I had two of the best teachers who I would work intimately with, um, you know, for a number of years. Um, and you did this research at Gotland in Sweden? No, I, I, I did the research here. Here. Dr. Richard Nielsen and Henrik Williams, Professor Henrik Williams in, in uh, Scandinavia. But I spent a lot of time on my own, and I really, you know, I know enough about runes, medieval runes, to be extremely dangerous. I don't consider myself a runologist, mm -hmm. but um, I know enough to be dangerous. You're not going to pull the wool over my eyes when it comes to runes pentatic numbers and, and their use in, in medieval times. Okay, one last question here. Now, in my videos on the Knights Templar, I always said that they did things kind of in code and allegory and symbolically. Is there that on the Kensington runestone? Absolutely, 100%. And that it ha kind of has to do with the date, so this date would be forever well, imprinted in this? Right. Well, that's one of the things that's going on. The date is encoded uh, within the inscription to protect the date that we can all see from alteration. Because all you have to do is add another line to any one of you know the, uh, the runes on the uh, date, and you can change the date. To change the date, yep. Yeah, but if you have the original date encoded within the inscription, which turns out is the exact same date, uh, you protect it from alteration. It's 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 a it's brilliant. 
and, and the method is consistent with the medieval dating practice using something called the Easter Table Dating Method. Okay. Well, Scott, I really appreciate this talk, and as far as my Ancient America series, as I said, I've done over 150 videos, and I think the Kensington Runestone is one of the most important stories coming from Ancient America, because it really kind of sets a table for what happened in the upcoming centuries. Right, absolutely, 100%. It should be uh, on display prominently uh, in Washington, D.C. It should have its own monument, and, uh, you know, uh, and I can tell you this, uh, being a Freemason, being a Knights Templar myself, um, I can tell you that uh, there is momentum that's building within the uh, fraternal order uh, to recognize and embrace the runestone for the Masonic document that it is. And um, I think um, we're going to be hearing a lot more about the runestone in the days to come, as Great. we should, because I think we finally have it all figured out now, and um, eventually the scholars will come along. They have to, because the evidence is overwhelming. And I, I you know, some people say that history changes one death at a time, right? Yep. Um, I think we can move a little faster than that and, uh, and sit down together and help them understand the parts that they didn't understand um, so that they can, you know, make a statement with all the evidence in hand and I'd be happy to work with them. Right. And I think today we are living in a new age of discovery where a lot of things need to be relooked at and the truth really needs to be pushed forward at some of this really important finds. Absolutely. The truth always comes to the surface eventually, and now is the time for the Kensington Roof Zone. Truth to be revealed once and for all. All right, Scott. I really appreciate you joining me today. I followed your work for a long time, mainly because you're a fellow Bulldog. But <laughs> And uh, I just go, go dogs. I, I appreciate your time. The Bulldogs are the home of the, uh, they are the depending. NCAA college hockey champion. I just thought I'd yep. throw that in there. Oh, and, yeah. Yep. But uh, That's great. I just appreciate your work, Scott, and maybe I'll uh, contact you as far as some other subjects in my Ancient America series. Maybe we can talk again someday. Sounds great. I appreciate it, and uh, call me anytime. All right, Scott. Thanks a lot, and go Vikings. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Yeah.